I can introduce myself first. My name's Kay Adam White. You can call me Cadam. I'm a principal engineer at Human Made, and I've had the tremendous honor of working on a project recently with the UIC team, including Ruthwick, who I'll pass it over to now. Hi, everyone. My name is Ruthwick. Uh, I'm the DevOps engineer at University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, it's nice to be uh, here, and thanks, Tom, for awesome introduction. And it's great. It's been great working with Adam. Um, so I'll start with my intro to WordPress multi-site platform we have at UIC. Uh, the, the platform we have is called RED. Uh, UIC RED is a platform for creating, managing websites across the university with a consistent theme and design. People across the campus can host their websites without extensive knowledge of development. Currently, RED hosts around 614 production sites and 300, 300 dev sites uh, under a single installation. Um, we have a simple landing page where people can reach out, uh, request for websites, and start working on their website. Uh, the, that is a simple landing page for the red we have. Um, we are a small team with a big network. Uh, we, uh, initially, red was hosted on on-prem, uh, on campus and infrastructure. Uh, it was entirely managed by us. Uh, we have a lot of issues with respect to uh, infrastructure maintenance. And Red was not scalable when we are posting it on-prem. Um, logging and monitoring was an issue. And then as we are a small team, most of our time was going on working on maintaining the infrastructure in, instead of developing new features. Uh, to, work on, to work on the infrastructure and scalability issues, we have evaluated various solutions. Uh, uh, and uh, we wanted some developers to work more independently and work on improving, uh, providing new features instead of maintaining the infrastructure. So we uh, we migrated to uh, uh, another infrastructure, moved Red from on-prem to Pantheon. Pantheon, uh, uh, we have after moving to Pantheon, as Red is a vast, vast network. We had some issues with Pantheon management APIs, and uh, we we have. We, management APIs and we, had, we were seeing some uh, issues with respect to hosting our sites there. Uh, sec and we, we wanted to have a support, uh, we, we needed a support to subdirectory multi-site installations. Uh, uh, we need to utilize it. We wanted a custom upstream setup and also have a, a robust CI-CD process so that we can work more on development than worrying about uh, building artifacts and pushing it, to the, uh, pushing it to the platform. That's when we reached out to Human Made. And human made has uh, worked with we worked with human made and we had a great uh, uh, great time and we made our process very automated such that we'd work more on developing features than working on uh, uh, infrastructure or concerning about security. Uh, the CI/CD setup helped us a lot. Uh, take it, Adam. And I can begin to segue into a little bit of an explanation of what we did together. Um, you're going to hear a lot more about Pantheon in the next talk, I'm sure. Um, but they provide a really great platform. But there's still a number of things that we were able to see when we came into UIC and we looked around at the repositories that they had, found some ways to look at how we can get from the existing history they had of the site to where they wanted to go and figure out what we could do to prepare the code base to be as flexible for their team as possible. It's a small team, big university. How do you manage that efficiently? I think one of the uh, taglines of this event was on a university budget. We all have a good sense of the resource constraints when you have people asking for things from all sides. And like I said, they were on Pantheon. The site itself is pretty robust, but there were opportunities to take things like Composer, which if you're not familiar with it, is a dependency management tool. It's something that we use very heavily in the WordPress community for installing plugins and themes from the overall community, uh, from the WordPress plugin directory, and then from also other paid plugins. You can use it to install things like Yoast SEO or Advanced Custom Fields Pro as well. and Looking at the UIC code base, uh, within Pantheon, there is an ability to, this is going to get more and more technical as we go on, um, but I'll try to keep it both high and low level. Uh, Pantheon supports a very sort of robust and opinionated composer setup, but it also lets you use it kind of how you want. So we looked at the UIC website and we said, 
we can take Pan um, Composer and we can use it to pull in only the plugins that are available third party off the shelf so that those don't have to live inside the code that Ruthwick's team manages. This means there's less code to send around. It means that there's less chance of committing something wrong and having one of the plugins that you depend on end up not working the way you expect in production. We like to have computers manage those dependency tools for us. It's much more reliable than us expecting to make sure that we do the manual process correctly every time. And once we introduced Pantheon, then we were able to configure it. So I'm sorry, I keep saying Pantheon instead of Composer. Uh, once we introduced Composer, we were able to configure it to drop the plugins into the correct directories for the existing UIC red website repo. Now, one of the upshots of this long term is that when you have your dependencies managed externally, you can actually also use tools for making sure that those stay up to date. And Composer dependencies, just as if you were using NPM in the JavaScript world, can be run through Dependabot on GitHub, uh, which is a service that will open an automatic pull request, an automatic code update, whenever a new version of a plugin comes out. And so very quickly off the bat, once we started the project, we were able to take the existing repo and pull out things that had to be done manually and start putting in place automated steps that would give the team the same abilities, but with a lot less manual effort and with a lot more reliability and repeatability. But something that we learned when we joined was that part of the process of updating the Rev website was actually managing things across two different repositories. There was a Pattern Lab repository, which has their design system and styles, and that would generate things that then got merged into the Red theme and deployed to the WordPress site. And the process of coordinating changes across these multiple repos was difficult. It was error prone. There was a manual process that had to be run on each engineer's computer. And that was the main focus of the conversation that we started together between Human Made and UIC was how do we make this more automated? How do we bring this into the cloud, into continuous integration? How do we let computers do that hard stuff for us? And how do we merge the repositories together? So looking at this, Merging code, you can do it just by copying and pasting and you're done, right? The problem is that you lose all of the benefits of source control if you do that. Uh, we use traditionally Git in the WordPress world for managing these types of projects. One of the benefits of that tool is that it gives you a really strong history view where you can look at code and you can say, huh, I'm having a, a really weird bug on this particular block on the home page. Why is it written that way? Who, who, what? person on my team wrote this garbage code. Oh, that was me last week. So without those tools, we lose the ability to remember the context in which the code was written. And maintaining that history is something that's very important for the longevity of a project, but it's also something that can be a little bit tricky if you have bad tools. Fortunately, there's a really excellent tool out there called Git Filter Repo, which is designed specifically to modify the history of repositories without losing the granularity of like what actually happened when and who worked on what. And so we were able to look at the Pattern Lab repo and the web repo and say, well, you know, th these can't all be in the same folder, but what folders do we want different pieces of this site to go into? Let's use filter repo to move things around. So if you were trying to merge a theme into another project, you can use this filter repo commands to say, just reimagine history as if we had always worked inside the WP content slash themes slash our theme directory. Whatever other information, like whatever other commits and history we have in this repository, let's keep that exactly the same, but let's move it into that new structure so that all of the histories there, all of the what we call blame is there about who wrote what and why, um, all of the individual messages about what was changed, but it's in the right place for our project. It's in the right place for this new structure. And having things set up like this, we were able to take the existing web repo, move all the code to where we wanted it to live into the new repo. We took the pattern lab repo, we did the same thing. We moved everything into a pattern lab subdirectory and then if you have tried to do a basic merge of those two different repos, Git's going to complain. It's going to say, 
that's all very fine and well. It looks nice that you've arranged things these ways, but I don't see common history here. And the way that a tool like source uh, Git in source control works is that it all is founded upon having a view of the past of a repo and knowing when code diverged so that it knows how to merge it back together. And fortunately, there is an allow unrelated histories flag to let us do exactly what we're trying to do now. It's something that we're a big fan of at Human Made because we frequently end up in this situation where we're trying to help somebody consolidate a disorganized web presence. And it's perfect for taking two different repositories that each deal with their own sphere of influence and bringing them together into one single repo that the team can manage as a whole. And that's what we did. The first step after adding Composer, the second step was to get those uh, code bases merged. And then we have the entire historical version of the web project in the web subdirectory with all of the WordPress folders, all the plugins, and then the Pattern Lab folder in the top level so that these things can be managed together. You can have a commit that ends up touching things in both places if you need. And we updated all of the build processes within the repos to allow copying the files properly between the two. So that's the first sort of organizational step. And then we need to put this out on the web and we need to set up the CI. And that process takes time. So one thing that would be a whole other talk that Ruthwick and I have spent a lot of time working on is figuring out how we synchronize changes how we do what we call a Delta update, where we actually set up this initial repo in late January, early February. And then other work was obviously taking place at the same time. Other people on the team were working on different parts of the site, other functions and other pieces of university life are continuing. And those changes, we had to be, have a way to take them from the old repo where they were being worked on actively and bring them into the new development mono repo that process we're not going to get into in depth, but it made very, very heavy use of an excellent tool called Git Rebase, where you can use uh, interactive view to take the history of a couple different pieces of new code and then move them over to a different uh, part of the project. So that definitely could be its own session. Uh, we won't spend much time on it, but something that you should think about if you are taking something like this on within your own organization is not just how do I take this code and merge it together initially, but how do I do it in a way where I'm going to be able to take any other in-flight work and make sure we don't lose that. We're gonna need to find a way to bring that over too between the time when you start the project and when you actually go live. And the one piece of advice that I would give is to consider using a tool like Filter Repo to remove any generated files from your repository history. So that would be minified JavaScript, minified CSS, compiled assets, and then those third-party plugins. If you take all of that out, there's gonna be less to move and fewer conflicts. And that was a big help to us on the UIC project. Once we had the repo set up, now it's time to try to find a way to automate the build and deploy process. And if you're not familiar with continuous integration, the basic concept is that we put things out into the cloud, we put their code up onto a host like GitHub, and then automated processes run based on that code. And Git will trigger an action, an event, when you push code, when a branch gets merged, when any individual thing happens, we can tie into those and listen to them and trigger different actions when they occur. So for example, we've built a workflow where we would say, we're gonna listen for pushes to the main branch so that we can trigger an overall deploy, but we're also gonna listen for pull requests being opened. Um, and we can actually filter that further. So we can say only run if we see PHP code have, has changed in this pull request, for example. And then once this event occurs, trigger a workflow. So we have a build process where when a developer pushes the code, it ends up in UIC's GitHub repository. That CI process kicks off, dispatches a build workflow. It's gonna run in the cloud the exact same build process that we could run locally, but it's gonna do it in an environment that we can guarantee to be consistent build to build. So we don't have to worry about whether we've changed the setting on our computer or whether there's something else happening locally. We can trust that it's a safe environment for that build to occur. And then we can also run additional scripts based on that to figure out where the code's meant to go and then push it up. The way that we ended up doing things on Pantheon, on this site with Pantheon was to 
take one repo and to push to each individual network. Uh, as Ruthwick mentioned, the RED project covers hundreds and hundreds of sites. It's actually been split out into a number of different Pantheon site instances and multi-site networks. And there's two different ways to manage those within Pantheon. You can have what's called a custom upstream, which is a repository that each one of the individual sites uses as its base. Or what we ended up doing here was we actually push the code directly. We generate the code that is intended to live on the site and then push that to each site without an upstream in play. Uh, we made this choice for a variety of reasons. Um, the main one being that it re reduced the number of different repositories that we had to worry about having in play, and it kept more of the branches inside the main UIC web projects, uh, the same structure. But there's a number of different ways to solve that. The important thing is that we're taking one code base and we're sending it out everywhere that it needs to go. And to do that, we're going to give a very quick crash course in how we would go about setting this sort of thing up in GitHub Actions specifically as a CI environment. There's others, Jenkins, Travis, you might have heard of, Circle CI. But GitHub, we really like it that it provides these actions integrated with the exact hosting solution that we prefer using and that so many of probably you in the audience are using as well. We, first off, when we're running the code, we can install PHP, we can install JavaScript, we can run the build. But then how do we know what to do with that? And so we can write custom actions, we can write custom scripts and say, here's a deploy target. Let's use that to say, are we deploying to main? Are we trying to push to the full network? Or are we deploying to one individual multi-dev instance, one test environment within Pantheon? We can spin those up on demand. It's really powerful. We are able to take a look at the branch name and the PR description when a PR is opened and say, all right, this new feature is actually named in such a way that we can create a multi-dev environment for it, or we can send it to an existing multi-dev environment. So we can write a bash script for that. And we can use that script to actually capture outputs. GitHub actions, when you're writing custom ones, you can store information from the individual steps and um, lost a slide here, but yeah. So the, you can see here that we're echoing the variables into a bash variable, and then we capture that in the GitHub Actions, and then we expose it for other parts of the process. And this means that we can start building a much more complex graph of what it is we're trying to do. We can check out the code base, build the system, but then in parallel, we can look and say, where are we going to send this? Again, is it for a test environment? Is it a full deploy? We authenticate with Pantheon. We make sure that the CI environment has a connection to the Pantheon repo or repos that it needs. We can do that through uh, secrets within GitHub. You can store an uh, authentication key that your CI process can use to talk to Pantheon. We will look at the information and say, are we setting up a test environment? If we do, then we also install Pantheon's Terminus CLI commands. And Terminus is a really cool tool. It's the Swiss Army knife of Pantheon. It lets you set up sites, deploy sites, promote things from dev to live. And we actually run it within our continuous integration process to create multi-devs if we need them. We don't tend to do the full sync because that takes a long time and there doesn't seem to be a way to tell Terminus to do that asynchronously, but we'll fire off the creation commands and then we'll close the, pro the CI out after that. And then once we're authenticated, once Terminus is set up, we push the code to where it needs to go. And that's gonna be either one environment if you're sending it to a particular test environment or we actually also, as a secret in GitHub, we store the list of repo URLs for all of the different multi-site networks that UIC runs, and we can push to all of them at once. If there's any errors, we report those out. The job fails, you can expect to see exactly what happens. And if there aren't any errors, we leave a comment on the PR saying, congratulations, your test environment is now available. So, as with the prior sections, uh, we'll make these slides available. There's a number of resources and guides out there around GitHub Actions. Uh, I'm not going to say that one's the best, but we do rely very heavily on GitHub's doc own documentation for this. It is pretty comprehensive. And then there's a lot of blog posts out there which explain different ways to do things with this, some of them in a WordPress context. And there's actually a lot of custom actions that are kind of WordPress specific. And real fast, before we open it up for Q&A, I wanted to look forward to 
what we could do on top of this foundation going forward. And with this CI process in place, we have the deploy working. We've achieved the main goal that Ruthwick described at the beginning, where we want to manage the whole network, the network of networks with a single code base that's modernized, that has a build process that's very reliable and uh, built within a continuous integration process. But we can actually also go in later on and we can start adding things like better code style enforcements and security sniffs. We can use tools like PHPCS with the WordPress coding standards to flag potential security issues in code as it comes in. And hopefully longer term, this will enable more parts of the university community to be able to safely contribute code to the website and not have that be an undue review burden on Ruthwick and his team. And with that, I'll hand it back over to you for a brief note on some outcomes. Uh, yeah. The collab with human-made help does simplify a lot of development and deployment process for us. Now we can uh, update our plugins without worrying about what what breaks the website. We have different what to uh, do that. Uh, and also testing with respect to testing, we can run multi-devs or uh, run some multi-devs without worrying about it. it's going to break the other websites. Uh, and it's automated right now using GitHub Actions. We can, they, get, they, can, they can be deleted once the pull request is closed. And now we can also deploy to multiple installations using single code base. And now we have the ability to automate our testing. Um, and then we can add more security and accessibility scanning into our build process. This has been a great experience and it really helped us with respect to improving our development and adding new features to our Red platform. Thank you. That's it. Thanks so much for having us. Okay, bringing myself back on stage. Thank you so much uh, to both of you uh, for that uh, for that session i think uh, from chat uh, that was uh, enjoyed by many um quick scan on the question i saw josh asking if there's any folks uh, or if you're aware of any folks using the pattern lab design system outside of the wordpress context uh, um broadly yes uh it's a tool that's been around for quite a while there's a lot of other tools out there for building out design systems but Pattern Lab specifically is a, a relatively well-established one, and mm -hmm. we've run into it outside of WordPress in a number of cases in some of my past lives. Excellent. Um, and another question asking to share uh, the resources that you had on the slides there, which I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I see, I know you've already said you will, so I guess that you will share those afterwards. Um, I think also the videos of all these sessions will, uh, will be available after uh, after we finish today and we've had enough time to download them all and do a bit of editing or whatever. So look for those uh, over the next few days. Um, in fact, Josh, who asked that question, if you're still watching us, you're the next session. So go over there and get ready, man. Um, Cause uh, uh, we're, uh, we're waiting for you in the green room, I believe if, uh, if I'm, uh, if I'm right. Um, but that maybe that's a good thing. Gives everybody a couple of minutes to like go and grab a glass of water or a, uh, have a quick bio break or something. 